When scientists look out into the universe and come up with theories to describe and explain the phenomena they're seeing, how do we know that our theories are describing real patterns that are out there in the real world and not merely projecting onto the phenomena what we want to see or expect to see because of some philosophical or religious or ideological commitment? Let me give you an example. When the Greeks were studying the heavenly bodies and coming up with explanations for the motions of the planets and the moon and the sun and the stars around the Earth, they had lots of observational data that they needed to account for. Why the stars maintain their relative positions, the planets drift against the background of the stars, why the planets and the sun and the moon all move within a particular plane across the sky, why the sun is higher in the sky in the summer and lower in the sky in the winter, why days are longer in the summer and shorter in the winter, why the moon shows phases that change on a 28-day cycle, why Mercury and Venus are never seen far from the sun, but Mars and Saturn and Jupiter can be seen on the opposite side of the sky as the sun. These observable phenomena put constraints on what an acceptable theory will look like. It should, at a minimum, not generate predictions that contradict these observational facts. But the Greeks imposed additional constraints on their theories as well. They believed that the heavens were the domain of the gods. The divine realm, the earthly realm, the terrestrial realm, was corrupted and changing. Things on earth come into being and grow and die. The heavenly realm, the celestial realm, on the other hand, was divine and therefore perfect. It had to be. And if it's perfect, that must mean that it's unchanging. For why would a perfect thing have any reason to change? So, the Greeks assumed that the only motion suitable to a heavenly body was perfect circular motion that doesn't speed up or slow down, ever. They viewed this as so obviously true that for them it had the status of a fact, but a conceptual fact, not an observational fact. You can't see the perfect circular motions from Earth. What we see from our vantage point are lots of irregular, non-uniform motions. But the Greeks believed that the true motions of the heavenly bodies must be uniform and circular. So they built that assumption into their models. And the result, in the hands of Ptolemy, the great 2nd century Greek mathematician, was an Earth-centered model of the cosmos, where the motions of the stars and planets are the mathematical composition of dozens of perfect circular motions with circles on top of circles on top of circles. And this ended up being a very successful predictive model. You could use it to predict the motions of the sun and the moon and the planets with great accuracy years in advance. This geocentric model was basically accepted without challenge for 1400 years until the 16th century when Copernicus came along and offered the first serious alternative. And now we can look back and see that in spite of its predictive successes, Ptolemy's theoretical model was wrong. In just about every way, a model can be wrong. The Earth isn't motionless at the center of the cosmos. Heavenly bodies don't move in perfect uniform circles. The stars aren't all at the same distance from the Earth. But more importantly, we can see that the Greeks were guilty of projecting a conception of divine perfection onto nature that wasn't really there, and that led them into error. And at the same time, the success of Ptolemy's theory and the status it had helped to reinforce this conception of divine perfection and its contrast with terrestrial imperfection. Now, in science studies and in the philosophy of science, we have a term that isn't widely known outside of a certain narrow usage, but which I think is useful. It's an inference pattern known as a double induction. Don't worry if you haven't heard of this, it's not standard usage. But here's the pattern. In studying some domain of nature, I bring some ideological or social worldview to bear, and I project that worldview onto what I'm studying. So I see this worldview reflected in the nature that I'm studying. That's the first induction. And then I turn around and say, look, our belief system is confirmed by nature itself. Our way of life is justified because it's natural. It reflects the natural order. That's the second induction. We use the observations of nature to rationalize the ideology that we projected onto our descriptions of nature in the first place. A classic example is British Victorian England with its monarchy and rigid class structure. Natural historians studying beehives would draw pictures of the social organization of bees that almost perfectly reproduce the monarchy and class system with a single queen bee, worker bees, drone bees, and so on. And then they could point at it and say, look, see, hierarchy and monarchy is natural. It's the way that 
industrious creatures were designed by God to fulfill their potential. There are lots of examples like this. With the rise of capitalism and a Darwinian survival of the fittest ideology, scientists started to pay more attention to competition among species in nature and the culling of the unfit as a primary mechanism of evolution. Social theorists then used these seemingly objective scientific descriptions of nature to support a Darwinian view of human society and social progress, and to justify programs of population control and selective breeding to reduce undesirable qualities in human populations. This kind of thinking can happen anywhere. On the political left, for those who were inspired by Marx and Engels' 19th century philosophy of dialectical materialism, there's a conception of nature there that's built into that worldview. It's a process-oriented worldview, where natural laws govern the formation of increasingly more complex forms of organization, and where the relationships and interconnectedness of the parts is the primary determinant of system-level behaviors. In this view, what determines the nature of the parts within the system is largely determined by the relation of those parts to the rest of the system and to their role within the system. Now, this kind of philosophical worldview is biased toward holistic theories and methods in science and biased against reductionistic approaches. And that has implications for how science is done and how it's used. You see this, for example, in Soviet science in the 1940s and 50s that rejected modern genetics, partly because it was a foreign import, but also because it was viewed by some in power as ideologically incompatible with dialectical materialism and their view of human nature. But at the same time, the Soviets developed mathematical systems theory to a high level, and what we now call theories of self-organization in the physical sciences, because those were viewed as congenial to the evolutionary system-oriented viewpoint of dialectical materialism. So just to bring this back to our original topic, when you're studying the natural world, you need to be on the lookout for biases that can creep in due to one's philosophical or ideological worldview. Now, to some extent, this is inevitable, but it's particularly concerning if you're appealing to science to tell you what's natural and then conclude that some particular social order that you happen to prefer is natural and therefore justified. People have found justifications for almost every social practice this way. Science tells us that slavery is natural, racial discrimination is natural, fixed gender roles are natural, colonialism is natural, hierarchy is natural, free market capitalism is natural, communism is natural. This is a seductive path. You don't want to find yourself projecting your ideology onto the science and then using that same science to justify your ideology. That's the double induction.